Alright, the yeah, chamber pressure looks good. Drop right now. Water towers can fly! Yes! go down to nominal. Bring it, let's see you dog. Yikes! You bet. Incur. We don't need any more of these. All right, folks, you know the drill. It's time for another exciting episode of NSF Live, our weekly show where we talk about what's going on with space. And this is one of our special shows because we've got a special guest. You can see him. No spoilers or anything. It was in the stream title. You know that today we're going to be talking with Mr. Peter Beck, the champion of carbon composites. The what else was I going to say? Oh, the rocket launching wonder from pretty close to down under the hat connoisseur of the spaceflight industry. Peter Beck, thank you so much for joining us today. How are you doing? Yeah, good. Thanks, Dust. Thanks very much. But I have to call you out. Uh oh. On, on your intro, yeah? there's every rocket except an electron. Oh, oh, we need to get some electron footage in that that's, intro. That's a, bit, that's a bit rough when you're inviting a guy on the show and you don't even show his rocket. <laughs> I think LC2 had a cameo in the Antares shot, but yeah, we need to get the rockets in there. Jack, I think Jack's in charge of that. Somebody at Jack Buyer so that we can get that <laughs> uh, get that handled there. Um, <laughs> Peter, thank you so much for joining us today. Also, we're going to have Thomas Berghardt, News Director for NASA Space Flight. Thomas, how you doing? I'm doing good. Excited to talk about Neutron today. All right. Well, maybe that needs to be in the intro, too, then. I think we've got some exciting <laughs> information you. about that. Um, and lastly, here, y'all, I'm John Galloway. Some of you may know me as DOS for NASA Spaceflight, but it's time to get started in today's NSF Live. Like I said, we've recently moved this show. It's our weekly show, but we just moved it over to Sundays, 3 p.m. We try to do it every single week, just talking about space news. And like I said, as well, today we're going to be focusing on big space news that's been a couple weeks here the new developments around Neutron that Rocket Lab and Peter here are working on. So really quickly, let me know over here in chat, um, can you hear us just fine? Just give me a 5x5 five five or something. See, there's a couple of people maybe a little bit low, so we'll get that resolved. And that looks good. You should be able to see us as well. You know, st standard show set up here. Also, hey, if you have questions for us over the course of the show, we'll be taking questions. We've got some cool software here in the back end, and all you have to do is tag us in chat, at NASA Spaceflight. goes in the queue, and if your question is uh, relevant to what we're talking about, Neutron, and, and not too crazy, we can actually get a little bit of a chance to ask Peter um, some of your questions. But put them in a chat, and we will get to them over the course of the show. Also housekeeping we appreciate your super super chats and stuff like that but when we do shows with special guests we don't spend any time on those sorts of things um, we do appreciate y'all supporting us so we can keep doing this but all the time will go to peter back today except for the time that i just used to make that disclaimer but thomas go ahead and get us started here talking about neutron the big news in reusable rockets for the next 30 years huh right yeah building a 2050s rocket right so I want to talk about Rocket Lab because they started off in a very different sort of aim to how they're going to improve access to space. You started with small, dedicated small launch services with the Electron rocket. And then once Electron was flying, that kick stage turns out it was actually really a satellite. And so you've added space systems with the Photon satellite bus um, as a way, another step towards improving that space flight access. And now that photons are flying, you're looking ahead to a medium lift launch vehicle that is also reusable, an evolution that also happened with Electron. So how are the all of these different offerings Rocket Lab's way of improving access to space? Yeah, I think um, I, I think you have to take one bit of a step back there as well. So, um, you know, it, it's it's not just about <clears throat> excuse me improving access to space. It's it's about you know how how do we really democratize space in in a, in a wider way. And, you know, the space systems division, I know that came as a, a bit of a surprise to a lot of people, but the very first kick stage that ever flew had a whole bunch of recesses in it for solar panels. And that was number, that was flight two, actually. So that, that's always been part of the plan from day one. And, you know, launch is incredibly important, but um, launch is kind of pointless if um, all the rest of the stuff isn't lined up um, as well. And if you look at the space industry, um, it's, it's very much uh, subscale. So you can go to just about any supplier in the space industry and say, I want 2,000 two of something, and you can just watch their head spontaneously combust. <laughs> um, it's, just, it's just a large number in the space industry. But any other industry, 2,000 of something is like a sample size. 
So what we've been trying to do with the Space Systems Group is, is really enable a sense of scale across, the satell across satellite platforms, um, and which in turn um, will help feed launch because unless there's a, you know, a, a supply, a large supply of satellites, then there's not going to be a large supply of launch. So that, that, that's kind of, that's kind of the, the, you know, the, the, <clears throat> the bigger level element here. And then um, Neutron, of course, comes in and, and we think um, plugs, plugs a really interesting gap. Uh, Electron has been super useful at, at um, really dominating the, the, the small satellite launch side. But as we looked across, um, we, uh, we, we, and really how Neutron was sized, is we looked at all the spacecraft that are going to be launched in the next decade and all the spacecraft that were launched in the previous decade. And that sort of rounded up to around about an eight ton number. So um, that, that's how, how Neutron was sized. So between Neutron and Electron, we can lift over 90% of everything that's predicted in the next decade or so. And you talk about future proofing through Photon, you know, that case stage was already integrating lots of things to build into Photon. Mm -hmm. um, that seems to be a common trend because even with Neutron, you're actually future proofing for future capabilities that we're definitely going to dive into later. But is that is that a prevalent sort of design philosophy at Rocket Lab where when you come up with new designs, you also incorporate the potential for future capabilities and evolutions that you're already thinking about? Well, sometimes we're not always that forward thinking, um, but 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 wherever possible. Um, so you know, the, the the photon satellite was an obvious one that that's where we're always going to go. Um, but there's a bunch of stuff like reusability on electron that we, mm -hmm. we in fact you know I, I didn't think was even possible. Uh, certainly not using traditional techniques. So there was right. no future proofing there. Um, so I'd like to, I'd, I'd like to to think that we um, you know that that we that we're good enough to future proof well in the future but the reality is that um you know these these things you know don't don't always happen like that right but still you you have showed the ability to pivot electron from a completely expendable vehicle to actually we can incorporate reusability with some minor changes um and of course i'm assuming that that is going to greatly inform the neutron program where these reuse experiments conducted with electron are going to give you tons of data that are directly applicable to neutron right oh, I, I wouldn't have even attempted to build a fully reusable first stage without doing the, the electron flights. I mean, we learned so much. Uh, plenty of people had tried and and um, not, not been successful in, in re-entering first stage um, under parachutes, for example. Mm -hmm. And really understanding that, that re-entry corridor, controlling it through that re-entry corridor. And then, you know, we've got a, a carbon composite vehicle, which, you know, it's like plastic. So um, keeping it, keeping it um, right within those, you know, temperature boundaries and, and re-entry conditions is, is non-trivial. So um, we learned a tremendous amount with, um, with Electron and Electron reusability that, and not, not just reusability, but across the board, um, you know, that everything that we've learned from flying Electron is what's informing Neutron. And I think a lot of people believe that um, like the bill of materials or the cost of parts of it is the most expensive part of launching something into orbit. And honestly, it's not. Um, the operational costs dwarf the cost of the, of the propellants, they dwarf the cost of the, of the bill of materials of the rocket. That's why with Neutron, you've seen such a focus on re removing anything operational possible. So what does that mean? What kind of things are you able to remove that reduce operational costs? Well, you think that dumb stuff, just like a strong bag, like it's a dumb old piece of steel, right? Right. right. You know, like full of valves, it's full of air conducts and fill lines and, and you know, helium umbilical purges and anti-geysering. It's just a whole, full of a whole bunch of crap. And all of that stuff you have to maintain and operate, um, you know, all, all of the time. Uh, so, you know, even even just, uh, I, think, I was thinking of Strongback, is actually takes a team of people to, um, to maintain and operate and it's always got to work and all the rest of it. And then you extrapolate that to all the launch pad systems and then, you know, downrange recoveries and all of these things. And actually, you know, that's the, the real cost of launching, launching rockets to space is, 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 not, is not the hardware. That's interesting. So are you looking at areas such as the personnel, the teams that are working on launch day and the, you know, ground infrastructure like we just talked about? Are those the kind of things that are, do you see that as even maybe a bigger challenge than designing a reusable vehicle? Uh, it's not really a bigger challenge because it's pretty easy just to delete. Like that's not hard. Um, but the, the harder thing is to you know incorporate them in, into the launch vehicle in a mass effective way. 
For example, mm -hmm. on Neutron, there is no there is no services tower, so all of the propellants for the upper stage are umbilical up through the the first stage down the down the um, the, the strakes down the side of the first stage and up and in, up into the second stage. But what that means is just a super simple ground based umbilical. There's there's no there's no breakover fixtures. There's no clamps. There's, there's no anything. Um, so you know you you you're with a rocket is a giant engineering compromise. So you're always trading one thing for the other. And so is that, so the main benefit of having this really clean ground infrastructure, I mean, we see in these renders, there's not much ground infrastructure really to talk mm. about. Is that, is the main benefit that cost benefit? Or are there also reliability or schedule uh, benefits there too? Yeah, of course. I mean, if you, the, less, the less stuff you've got to deal with, then the less stuff you have to maintain. So, so yeah, no, there's, 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 there's operational and cost benefits. And that this is what, you know, after launching, you know, 23 times, you, you, you kind of, it's really obvious where the cost is in, in launching a rocket. And um, a, a small rocket is way harder than a bigger rocket um, because mm. it doesn't matter. There's a lot of stuff that are completely, you know, rocket size agnostic, like flight safety, for example. Right. Right. The flight safety team launching a really large rocket versus the flight safety team launching a really little rocket is the same. There is no difference. So the one thing that Electron has forced us to do is be hyper efficient at, you know, all of those tasks that usually would be really big teams. So, you know, we, we've got a, a seven and a half million dollar sticker price on an Electron. If you've got a big rocket, say with a $60 million sticker price, you can amortize that team across the $60 million sticker price. Mm -hmm. For us, that's not an option. So we had to come up with ways of, of, of really streamlining all of these things into really, really small and efficient teams. But that, that's why on a small rocket, the, the majority of the cost go, is, is all around the launch and the launch infrastructure, not around the cost of the parts of the rocket. Yeah. And that, that's got to carry forward into like mass efficiency too. If you, you know, a flight computer is a flight computer, regard, whether no matter what type size of vehicle it's controlling, totally. if you put that on a small vehicle, the mass fraction that of your flight computer yep. is way higher. Um, so there's benefits there. And, we, and when we talked about reuse at the beginning of rocket lab you know you said you said yourself it doesn't make sense for a small launch vehicle at least it didn't seem so initially um, because all of those things that don't change size when you scale it down to a small rocket just make it really hard to be mass efficient on a reuse project yep. totally we, we call it the pressure transducer quandary because, okay. <laughs> because you know you can add a pressure transducer to a, a vehicle like electron and it represents 0.0001 percent of the payload yeah you put the same pressure transducer on neutron and there's not enough zeros to even right. <laughs> make it worthwhile trying to count. Yep. So, you know, in, in, in electron, we measure stuff in grams and neutron, we measure stuff in kilograms. Mm -hmm. So that's the, the, that, that's the fundamental difference. That makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right. So I want to backtrack a little bit because we were talking about electron and how that's going to inform neutron. So let's start there. How are mm -hmm. these electron reuse experiments going? The last mission had a successful splashdown yeah. once again. There's been a few of those now. And it mm -hmm. looks like the next reuse experiment is going to take that helicopter and actually maybe make a catch attempt. So must yep. be going well, right? It's going super well, actually. Really, really happy with um, with with the results we've been getting. So we can we can we can you know reliably say that we can re-enter the and control the rocket during re-entry now over and over again. Um, and we can um, we can deploy parachutes and 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 get it to where we need to get it. The last flight was really about um, we have to rendezvous with the rocket coming from space uh, under and then ultimately under a parachute with a helicopter. And you can't just stick the helicopter you know right where that rocket is is predicted because you've got a whole lot of scenarios you have to allow for like you know a parachute not deploying or um, you know a failure all these kinds of things. So really the last test was, can we can we work through all of these scenarios and actually have the rocket uh, accurately rendezvous with the helicopter uh, in such a way that you could catch it? And the answer is yes. So uh, we got a giant helicopter that's on a ship right now making its way over here and um, we'll, uh, the next recovery flight we will be attempting to catch. Nice. And uh, I believe that next flight will also have a new thermal protection system on it. And Das, I don't know if you can get the image of this, um, but it makes the Electron is definitely going to be sporting a different look. Is that <laughs> yeah. specific to the Electron architecture or is that also part of informing some things for Neutron? Yeah, I mean, um, so we've re-entered a number of Electrons now and we've cut them all up, um, done all the materials testing and, um, and the, 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 the carbon is fine. 
Um, but what, what you what you have to allow for is kind of some, you know, if you get some mutation on stage, for example, you can get some off-axis heating. And you don't want to have to throw away a stage because one little piece saw a bit of transient heating. So all as the, the TPS system does for us is, uh, is just gives us margin. So, um, you know, really we're able to control the environment such that the vehicle is not getting cooked. Um, and uh, if you put a little bit of TPS on it, that even, even if, if there is some areas that get a little bit hot for whatever reason, then you don't need to worry about it at all. And it's, it's quite an interesting TPS system because we have no mass, right? We have no mass margin to, to be playing right. with here. So this is, this is an aerogel um, graphite, which is um, really quite a unique, um, uh, you know, TPS system with a, a thermal conductivity of, as you'd expect with, with aerogel of like zero. So um, it's a really, really uh, in, interesting system that weighs nothing, but is, um, but, but also provides that, that level of, thermal margin if we do get some kind of transient buffering and heating and so this that there it is the, the shiny electron which is of course mm. very different from the carbon composite is it but this is a, a layer on top of the normal carbon right right it, yeah, yeah. yeah 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 it's a very very thin film yep very thin film so that is super cool to see and are you expect is this an like a one-off experiment that you're seeing how it's going to work or are you expecting reusable missions going forward that will pretty sure have this TPS on it? Um, well, I mean, we, we, we'll see how it performs. I mean, it's, it's a very, very new material. Uh, if you actually have a look at, uh, if you look closely on the last recovery, you'll see um, there's bands of this stuff uh, up the first oh. stage. So, so we actually, we actually tested it um, on the last flight and we've had it on our, um, our, our stack test tanks for about three or four stack tests now. So, um, so the material is behaving um, you know, looking really, really good, but um, you know, the proof's always in the pudding during during yeah. the full-on reentry. So, um, so, but yeah, it it just it certainly provides a, a level of margin that um, is quite luxurious for its mass. All right, excellent. Uh, let me see if I have other electron reuse questions here, um, and then I know we're going to get into some chat questions in yep, a second yep. too. Um, oh. But, uh, oh, my other question, we also hit a new launch cadence milestone recently, two launches in pretty six, quick succession under three weeks. And um, good, I know Broccoli Lab, a big part of them has been trying to ramp up launch cadence and there's been a lot of challenges with that, especially in New Zealand recently. But two mm. launches in pretty quick succession next year, hoping that that'll continue. And does that also inform quick turnaround times for neutron operations, although that might be different because you're doing it through reusability rather than yeah. manufacturability? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so we've 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 actually um, hit this cadence once before a couple of years ago. So um, it's just it's always it's always things that get in the road. Mm -hmm. um, generally, um, I would say, except this year, it's always been kind of the cadence is customer driven, so customer readiness driven. Um, this year, of course, we got slammed with COVID, with New Zealand just completely shutting down, and and uh, it's almost impossible to get people through the border, and it's just been a real you know. But I mean that that that's pretty much finished now, so we're we're back into it. But um, next year, we're certainly, there's a lot of rockets on the floor and, and it's going to be a very, very busy year. So, you know, like I say, um, the, the cadence is, is quite often defined by cu customer readiness mm -hmm. you know, rather than rocket readiness. I mean, we could see you, you guys love sharing the images of the factory floor, which just have lines of rockets. So yeah. clearly the rockets are there. <laughs> yeah, uh, we just need something to launch on them. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, we've got plenty. I've got plenty of technical detail questions about everything Neutron here. I want to open it up to chat because obviously we're taking chat questions in the show too. So, Doss, yep. you want to bring in some of those? Yeah, absolutely. Let me uh, go through here. We've got a couple in the queue. Um, let's see. Do we want to stick to a couple that are electron related, or we just do we want to jump into Neutron? We can do yet? some electron questions. Okay. Yeah. Let's see if we get anything. Let's... Um, here's one. I mean, it's, it's currently we're launching Electron from New Zealand. And the question mm. for Peter is, will Neutron also launch out of New Zealand? And if not, what's the future of the Mahia launch site? Are you just doing Electrons? Are you going to launch this from somewhere else? Are you still looking at launching Electrons from Wallops or other places? How, well, how does that announcement sort of look at the, those things? Yeah, so for Electron, you know, we'll continue to ramp the launch rate um, in the Mahia Peninsula at LC1. Uh, LC2, we are still waiting on uh, NASA to just finish their certification of their flight software, which uh, which they assure us is going to be complete by the end of the year. So um, we'll be able to uh, we'll be able to you know release Electron's Fury out of out of LC2, which will be which will be great. Um, 
it's a it's been a very very long and tough delay for us to to, yep. to kind of deal with. Um, and with respect to Neutron out in New Zealand, the challenge that New Zealand has got is is the industrial base. So if we take all the liquid oxygen in New Zealand and pour it into a neutron tank, it half fills the tank. Ah. So um, there's there's some industrial base issues down in New Zealand. So Neutron will primarily be a US launch vehicle, um, you know, for the, for at least for the short for, for the intermediate term. Will we? Okay. Yeah. Out of the US. Something I hadn't is thought it? of, just the, just the total amount of fuel and propellants available, I guess, uh, should I say, on the islands? Country. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> a little country, yeah. Yeah, and if you're having to import it in, it's not, it's going to sort of cut down some of the other margins trying to get uh, capacity that's not already there, huh? Yeah, and plus Neutron is a, is a big vehicle. You yep. know, it's a seven-meter diameter base. That's, that's you know, that's a, that's a significant thing to transport. All right. Yeah, and it's, of course, we keep telling you about it as an eight-ton class launch vehicle. It's because that's its reusable capacity, Correct. but it's sized for a 15 ton class vehicle because that, you know, if you look at traditional expendable rockets, that's the size you're looking at. Okay. So it is a very large vehicle. Yes. Correct. Um, Here's... Regarding the launch site, is Wallop still that base plan for a US based launch site? Although you also mentioned the clean launch infrastructure, which using an existing launch site maybe doesn't align with that. Yeah, I mean, I would say that there's a, there's a, a fairly good um, uh, competitive selection process going on right now for a, for a launch site. Gotcha. gotcha. All right. Very excited to hear more about that. More, uh, more questions for you, Dust? Yeah, just an, another quick one. Um, we know there's some different hardware that flies on Electron, and is there any specific hardware that's moving forward onto Neutron, like something like a flight computer or something like that? Yeah, or yeah, yeah. It, a lot of things you learn in Electron just move right up because of what we talked about earlier, right? Oh, look, yeah, 100%. Like, you know, avionics, it doesn't matter if it's a big rocket or a little rocket, it's just, just the same. So, yep. um, so there's a lot of stuff moves across from there. But even things just like, you know, vent and fill valves, for example, um, whether it's a two inch vent and fill valve or a, you know, six inch vent and fill valve, it's the, the design is going to be the same. So, you know, we've got just years and years of heritage of these operation of these systems and knowledge of these systems. So there'll be a lot of stuff that just gets scaled slightly yeah. um, and, mo and moved across. Yeah. Speaking of scale, I mean, we know we have the the photon, right? Are you ever going to maybe look at releasing a swarm of photons out of a neutron fairing or something like that? I, totally. I mean, the, the form that the, the, the photons actually do stack, so they will, they they stack quite nicely on top of each other. Yeah. So yeah. Who knows? There you go. All There's right. got to be a cool name for a stack of photons. There's like a, oh, a light beam or something. I don't know. There's yeah, there's yeah, a pun yeah. to be made there. It's a wave or a particle. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Like... Yeah, they... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's not get into that. A wave of photons, <laughs> like. <laughs> Um, in terms of questions that are sp that are talking sort of about electron, that's what I've got here, Thomas. If you want to start forging ahead. Yeah, sure. Um, let's talk Neutron hardware, because in the update, you stated that some hardware is already out there. You talked about both test tanks and then getting ready for first engine firing next year. So how has that hardware been? How's the manufacturing gone so far? And even if you've actually started testing those tanks? Yeah, so um, the tanks under construction are a subscale tank. Um, we, we're just um, testing different uh, closeout designs. Uh, and it's you know this is a, a an evolved material from the material that we've used on on electron, so mm. um, so we've 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 made some improvements there on both the material and the laminate. Um, we're also doing uh, full scale areas where um, we're using the automatic um, fiber placement machines um, to to do hatches and bits and pieces just to get some uh, some of the more complicated details um, sorted. And then uh, we'll run through a series of early next year. We'll run through a series of um, subscale tank, uh, you know, tests just you know to to um, validate uh, you know laminates and, and kind of design philosophies, and we're pretty much straight into full scale tanks. I mean, the 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 one the one challenge you know the one challenge with composites is it's not that easy. They're not that very easy to iterate with, because mm -hmm. you have to build uh, your mold, and your mold is a very expensive you know element yep so if you want if you want to iterate a design really really quickly composites are pretty painful because you have to start again and make the mold and and that's like building the rocket in the first place except in a much slower way so um our, our philosophy and our approach at rocket lab has been always been to fail fast and uh but fail fast at the the component and the subsystem level right. by the time we get to, to full scale and tanks and bits and pieces like that um we don't expect to fail so um, we kind of kind of in the middle kind of philosophy rather than just um, 
you know, push stuff out and blow it up versus spend forever analyzing stuff. Um, right. We're kind of in, in the middle of approach there. Um, you know, fail fast on, like I say, components and subsystems and the risks and bits that have a lot of risk. But when it comes to, you know, full scale systems, um, we don't like to, to fail at that point. Yeah, you, you don't have to make a big show of it to find the failure point in the system. Like it doesn't have to be a massive crash or explosion or something like that. You can certainly piece it out a little bit more than uh, some people may be excited to see. <laughs> Yeah, 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 and yeah. it's and it's and it's just a it's it's just a different way of of, um, of you know and it's worked very well for us. I mean, we started the design of Electron in 2014, and we flew our first one in 2017. Um, so, you know, it's it's a very rapid way. Of, we found it a very rapid way of doing it. Oh, I know an entire community of Space Five fans who enjoy watching tank tests. So if that footage is, you know, <laughs> willing to be shared later next year, I think we have a bunch of people who would be really interested in watching. Yeah, sure. <laughs> well, we, we have to blow some up. Yep. So, um, right. we, so we, we, you, ultimately, you need to know, uh, you know, the ultimate failure mode. So, mm -hmm. um, so there'll be a few that we um, we let go. It's always fun. Yeah, you know, some people yeah. that are very interested in seeing that sort of stuff. So, just look us up <laughs> if you have any tanks being crushed well, or leaking or whatever. <laughs> I think I think the reality of that one is that though, because of the scale of the tanks, that, that's not sort of something that you can put in a tent or leave outside. So, right. you know, it's got to be outside. So, I think. You know, tank ruptures are generally fairly public events anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Would those tests be done at your facility in New Zealand? Are you doing tests at another facility somewhere? Like, where would those be happening? So, look, one of, one of the early design trades we made is um, on diameter because, uh, you know, a, a lot of the diameters of launch vehicles are constrained by either, you know, ships or bridges between California and Florida. Yep. And that, that, that's just a terrible design constraint to have to, you know, leverage upon yourself. So because we are such a large diameter vehicle, um, we're going to be building this at the launch site. Right. So, um, so, yeah, so, so that, that's where we'll be doing all the initial, um, you know, all the initial uh, destructive tests as well. Gotcha. Definitely looking forward to hearing all about the, the launch site that the gets selected get selected and where all that'll happen. Yeah. Yep. Well, it's not just a um, launch site. It's also a factory, to, you know, to the point. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, and then the new Archimedes engine, which hoping to get fired next year, is that mm -hmm. starting to get, is that still in the design phase or are there components there ready too? You know, I mean, that, that's, that, that's still, um, still in the design phase, but um, we're moving very, very rapidly. So, uh, you know, um, both the, the, the locks and, um, and, and fuel pump uh, designs are, are complete and, um, you know, we're moving, moving pretty rapidly into GG injector testing and single, single element testing. And, um, and, you know, the way that the, the, the thing I'd say about Archimedes is like, if you're interested in, in like a state of the art, super high performance engine, you're going to be very disappointed with Archimedes. Um, <laughs> the, whole, the whole point of Archimedes is, is margin. Like if you're, if you're sitting on a seven, seven, eight, seven, or you choose, choose your aircraft of choice and you look out the window at that engine, you want to know that that engine has got like two times safety factor yeah. not, right. not point two times safety factor yeah yep. yep and and this this is the challenge right and this is why materials are so important is because as i said before everything is everything is a com compromise when you build a rocket so if if you have if you have um you know structures that are heavy then you have to make up with it with propulsion yep that's mm -hmm. your only solution if you have structures that are light then you know you, you you've you've put your pain on yourself in building light structures but you take the pain out of propulsion right and from a re reusability standpoint that is absolutely critical is to have propulsion systems with a ton of margin and propulsion systems that are you know infinitely reusable and in, in, at least in some senses yeah. so um cho choose which area you want to you know to endure the pain um and it's either propulsion or it's structures Makes it's sort of like you were saying in the update video when you're talking about Neutron and releasing the information for the first time. Um, do you want an engine that, oh, this engine can go to 11 all the time, no matter what? Like, is that really the engine that you want to be reusing over and over again? Or exactly. uh, do you want a little bit more of a, a margin, like you said? It's, all right, we're yep. just taking it easy. We got this lighter structure. We don't have to run it at 11. We can run it at 8, and it works fine. Yep. It makes a lot yep. of sense. Does that basically mean you'll be firing these engines for flights at below maximum thrust, or is it just? Are we talking exclusively built-in margins? Or like, yeah, the you margin. know the combustion chamber can just take way more pressure than it would ever fire at. Right. Totally. Totally. Like designing the engine with uh, one and a half thousand psi chamber pressure, and you know copper lined, all just super 
boring. Like, you know, nothing, nothing's pushed to limits. Look at the, you know, turbo pump shafts and wells and things and just just keep huge margins and, and all of that stuff and bearings and seals and and you know, just drive nothing to the limit on propulsion. And what you end up with is is a pretty, you know, from a I guess a, a an engine perspective, a pretty ho hum engine. Um, but actually, um, that's exactly what you want. You you want right. you know, I guarantee if you're an astronaut on the top, you want a ho hum engine. Right. You don't want that. Right. Yeah. something that is that is absolutely pegged to the red line. Yeah. In in space, you don't typically want an exciting day on the launch pad. You just want a bog <laughs> standard, boring day on the launch boring pad. Is good. Yep. Boring is good. Goes yeah. to space. All right, we're good. Everybody go home. We're good. Like we don't want excitement. Yeah. We don't need any more of those. But I mean, like I say, th- th- this is why the choice of carbon composites was so fundamental for us, because um, you know, if you if you take stainless steel, it's it's a seven point eight density, alum, you know, aluminium two point seven, carbon composite one point six. Mm-hmm. So you know, automatically you're you're at least twice or three or four times lighter than any of the metallics. Um, so what that, that you know that that that's a big deal. That I mean, because the majority of the mass of the vehicle is in the structures, so that that makes a huge huge impact into not not just uh ascent but it makes a massive impact on descent as well so um you know re-entering a neutron is vastly different to, to re-entering say a metallic vehicle uh, that, that's because it's so like think of think of it like jumping off the roof with an umbrella yep versus jumping off the roof with a bowling ball i mean it's 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 that that's kind of the difference like you've got a in a very large diameter you have a high ballistic coefficient with something that's very very light yep so right. you know with respect to heat generation and um, you know getting this thing through the atmosphere with in the in the most you know economical way possible uh it's super awesome so if you look at you know the standard neutron re-entry profile it doesn't have three burns it only has two it has the rtls burn and then it has a landing burn and that's so no entry burn doesn't need an entry burn it's right. because and just like electron electron doesn't need a re-entry burn either Right. Um, and we've mastered that because, you know, ballistic coefficient is, is okay. It's not great, but it's so light um, that, that everything happens. You know, it's very, very easy. Whereas neutron is great because it's also really, really light, but it's got this great big hunking base, mm-hmm. which gives us that awesome ballistic coefficient. Yeah. It, if you if people have watched our show before, we've talked about this on a few occasions, especially uh, back with John, Jonathan McDowell, where we talk about things reentering, right? Mm-hmm. And we talk about the mass to drag ratio, where yes. you've got a you've got a lot of drag on a big surface, but you don't have a lot of mass, and that makes it easier to use the atmosphere to slow down. That's exactly what Peter's talking about here. Instead of something that's super heavy and big, we're gonna have something that's lighter and big. Lighter thing will slow down a lot faster, right? Yeah, 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 like the you know the the heating is you know it's just so much more manageable. Yep. And so, so back to the engines really quickly. So sorry. we're talking about designing this engine with all of the all of this margin here. So we're not talking about it designing mm-hmm. in a way where if you were flying an expendable mission, you could throttle the engines up even more because you don't plan on reusing them. Or is that something that you also oh, no, you could, could do? You could. Yeah, you no, could. you could. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If if you want to juice up the GG and and um, you know go for it, then sure um but huh. you know it's yeah you, you could totally do that because you just said so it's the eight-ton class with a reusable configuration and that's baseline to a return to launch site pro- profile mm-hmm. and then fully expendable okay. not recovering anything does that mean that neutron will be modular enough that you can say remove those landing legs remove the arrows control services you know throttle up the engines and and go expendable that way huh yeah, you, you could, you could. I mean, the way we think about expendable is, you know, the the, the has a life, right? Um, so, you know, kind of at the end of life, then that's the that's the time to to run an expendable flight. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you really wanted to juice it up, you know, lift more than fifteen tons, then fine, you you, you could. Um, but you know, our, our kind of baseline is 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 a return to launch site, um, and um, you know, full reuse on the first stage in a very simple and minimal way. Uh, I think that's where we offer our customers, you know, the best bang for the buck. Yeah, I've got the, how uh, many? F- oh, yep, go ahead. Real quick, I've got the website here. So, so we've seen this in the past, where it's like, oh yes, reusable pricing, but expendable payloads. Like we've seen this sort of marketing thing happen. Um, mm-hmm. But the fifteen thousand that you're talking about here on the website is sort of not this juicing up and removing fins and stuff like managing no, weight. No, no, this no. is just, just as it is. Sh- just, send it. Yeah, just don't. 
Yeah, yeah. In, in fact, you probably find it's more than that because that, that probably still has some margin for a, for an RTLS burn, but um, hmm. but the, but there there or thereabouts, you know, that's just yeah. as it is. See you later, which will hurt, to be honest with you. <laughs> sure. Yeah. I mean, um, as, as much as you know, someone might want to buy an expendable mission, that would it would still be very painful at that point. Yeah, makes sense. Sorry, Thomas, go ahead. I... Yeah, no, I but I agree. Is like when other reusable systems, when like an expendable mission comes, it's like, oh, well, why? We reusable <laughs> rockets are so cool. It belongs um, in a know. museum, like. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah. So then, talking about the um, flight rate and things like that, mm. um, reusability and not flying up to those margins, are you expecting that to be a major part of Rocket Lab's custom? You know customer request or are you expecting people will be operating under the reusable architecture well i mean um the, the reason why we sized it to an eight ton is because that's where we believe the majority of the market was going to land um so uh you know we expect the majority of the missions to be you know reusable obviously but i mean like i say there will be uh end of life on the vehicle so at that point that's when you roll in some expendable flights if, if gotcha requirement yeah when does that end of life look like it might be or is it too early to tell i mean with electron you even said like listen if we could reuse it once that doubles the manufacturing rate so that's great but if neutron if you're designing it for a reusable architecture you probably want more flights than that yeah 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 and, and look it's 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 yet to yet, yet to be seen um sure. you know we need we need to we need to reuse a reuse a few but i mean um the, the object of the exercise is to um is, is to get as many as possible um i could i could put some number I'll give you some number but at this point it's pretty arbitrary until sure. we, until we actually get data back yeah gotcha. i mean the the one the one constraint that um that, it, that i did set from day one of neutron's design was it needed to be turned around in 24 hours and i want to be clear here it's not that i expect to actually turn it around in 24 hours right and the point of the point of that constraint was to get everybody thinking outside the box because mm -hmm. if you if you if you say you want to return this vehicle around in 24 hours then you're not landing down range because it's a three day haul home. Right. Uh, if you want to launch it in 24 hours, then you're not pulling engines out and refurbing engine engines. So, um, so that 24 hour constraint drove the decision to go for Kirilox, sorry, not Kirilox, Methylox. Uh, it, it drove the decision for, you know, return to launch site. Um, so that, that one constraint actually provides a whole bunch of goodness when it comes to thinking about actually how you operate the system. Yeah. It got rid of all the launch infrastructure because you can't be you can't be um, you know faffing around with um, you know breaking it over and, uh, and integrating horizontally and all those kinds of things. So it really shaped the vehicle in unique ways. Even even the uh, what was it the hungry hippo fairing design where the fairings actually stay Correct. attached to the top. A lot of that builds into that where you land on your That's tail. You, I could see a crane rolling over with another payload and just bloop, dropping another payload in. Fairings close yep. up and off you go. You know. Yep. You yep, get it reconnected exactly. to the ground infrastructure and stuff like that. But the, a lot of design decisions make this look like it's just one vehicle. It goes up, it comes right back down again, and it's ready to go. And it makes a lot of sense what you're saying there, removing all of those other. It's like, oh, it's reusable, but you got to jump through all these hoops to make it reusable, right? Exactly, exactly. And and, and that's, you know, the vehicle is designed to spend its whole life vertical. Like breaking a vehicle over is just a pain. Yep. You're going to have all of a sudden your strong backs and clamps and on and on it goes. So um so yeah no and you're not going to do that in 24 hours yeah so yeah everything is driven from that that baseline assumption yep good how is that vertical integration going to work if you have a payload sitting on top of a second stage and obviously the second stages are going to need to be you know that's going to be the manufacturing constraint because they're initially expendable at least uh, right. but if you're integrating that vertically you have to have some sort of clean room element to that and then you're bringing it out to a launch pad what are the thoughts on how that might have to work yeah, there's, there's quite a nice little design we've got going in there, which we'll talk a little bit about later, but uh, it enables you to, to do kind of a very clean integration of the of, of the upper stage and the payload on, all in one. So, yeah, no, that, 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 so payload integration was one thing that we spent a very long time on because I think, you know, if, if you're designing your first rocket, I certainly know that we did this, um, the, you, you don't really think about your customers so much. It's always about the rocket. And the customer comes sick and so, oh, actually, you mean you, you want full, you know, nitrogen purges 24 hours and, and all of these kinds of things. Yep. So um, so we've, we've learned all those lessons. So the way that Palo is integrated is, is um, I, I think, it's going to be really, really nice for customers. Interesting. Looking forward to hearing about that. Yeah. You mentioned that the Methylux fuel selection actually was driven mm -hmm. by that 24-hour turnaround time. Can you talk about how those two things are even related? 
100%. So if you look at the time it takes to reuse uh, a rocket engine, a Kirilox rocket engine, the majority of the time is spent decoking and desgunging GGs and, mm. um, and, and chambers. Like yeah. kerosene's an awesome fuel. I mean, anybody says that like um, you've already got one cryogenic fuel, so it's easier to just have two cryogenic fuels. That's just not true. I mean, <laughs> right. Why would you want two fuels that are giant pain in the butt? I mean, so kero- kerosene is so easy. So, um, you know, we, we didn't, we didn't move away from, from kerosene easily, but the reality is that we, we've, you know, we, we run even, even Rutherford's that don't have a GG, you know, you still got coking that you need to, you need to deal with in the yeah. main TCA. Once you put a GG in there, like it's just scunge everywhere. Um, whereas if you run, um, you know, methylops, you can, you know, eat, eat, eat your lunch out of the, the GG tailpipe. <laughs> so, um, so that, that, that's, you know that that's good and because we've got such lightweight structures you know the the trade between you know the lower density propellant um and the mass of the structure and the isp is a winning trade so you actually come out on top whereas you know if you've got metallic structures you end up kind of paying for that slightly negatively um with the increase in isp and then but the increase in well the, the, the decrease in density in the fuel so it was a it was a net win all around for us Except the downside is we have cryogenic fuel now. Right, right. I, I actually had to turn over this way and Google whether or not scunge was a real word. <laughs> apparently it is. It means dirty. <laughs> Muck, scum, dirt, dirtiness. Um, I, that's a real thing, apparently. I had never heard the word scunge before, so I've learned something today. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, we see it. We actually, we actually see it on electrons in the stage. We call, you know, it's, it's like the, you know, the stage two, you know, Kira start sneeze. Yep. Oh, yeah. It's just... Of, yep. of um, so there you go um and then that the other part of archimedes that's interesting is you're going with the gas generator cycle with a methalox engine which is mm-hmm. the other methalox engines that are in development right now are not going that route so what mm-hmm. was the driving requirement behind that cycle there's a couple of couple of things firstly uh, it's all about margins and it's all about um it's all about reusability so the gg cycle is just you know Huge margins. Um, nothing's nothing's spinning at crazy RPMs, and from from an engine development standpoint as well, is it's it's just super quick and super easy. I mean, the upper stage for us right now is is um, expendable, and the jury's out whether or not that upper stage will e- either make sense to be uh, reusable anyway. Right. Um, and if you're going to throw away an engine, then you actually you absolutely want that engine to to, to be as low as low as prices as you can. Yeah. And also, uh, if, think about it from a reusability standpoint. You have to think differently. So, if, if you look at, I remember Werner von Braun once said a rocket engine is nothing but a sheet metal, um, you know, turbo pump with a piece of sheet metal on the side. So, if there's anything that needs serviced, it's going to be your turbo pump. So, having your turbo pump, in, you know, to the side of the engine, and the way we're designing it is, you can remove that turbo pump super easily and just, yeah. you know, put a new one back on. Whereas if you've got like you know a, a more more exotic cycle, it's all generally stacked on top of the chain, but the engine's coming out at that point. Right. Um, and uh, whereas you know GG, you can quite easily you know swap out a GG package and and where you go. So hmm. this is this is this is thinking about it you know from from absolutely from a reusable and a service you know serviceability standpoint. And when going through this engine design, there's also considerations regarding the type of injectors you're going to use and things like that. And mm. I think you may have mentioned in, in previous talks about Neutron that there's a very specific type of injector that makes that is like the obvious choice for gas generator methylox engine. Mm-hmm. What does that design process look like? Yeah, you know, I mean, so with a meth, uh, with a methylox engine, obviously the um, you know using the, the the fuel as your coolant. So um, basically. The, the temperature of the fuel is ambient when it exits the injector. So it's it's like 20 degrees C, so it's in a gaseous form. So you have kind mm-hmm. of a gas liquid injector and, and typically a coax is, you know, is a good injector for, you know, you get great shear from the, the high velocity gas um, and, good, and really, really, really good mixing. And that's different from Rutherford, right? Because that's a very different fuel combination and ambient uh, sort of environmental totally, oh, yeah, totally. and, and and rutherford is uh, rutherford is just a screamer of an engine so right. <laughs> it's, it's, it's an incredible incredible engine um the, the performance we've been able to extract out of that little engine is building like super high performance little engines is really difficult um mm-hmm. especially ones you know it's it's an all uh, all in canal chamber so it's not copper lined so um and then you know the, the heat flux doesn't scale nicely with with the size of the engine so you end up with you know, it's much much hotter per unit area in a small engine than it is a large engine. Right. So, 
yeah, no, the, 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 the rubber propulsion team have, have built, you know, an incredibly difficult engine to build there. Um, so when we look at Archimedes, it's like, okay, let's sort of sit back in the armchair just a little bit here. Interesting. Uh, Das, want to take some more chat questions? Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's, uh, well, <laughs> here we go. Sonderax asked if there's any more information on Archimedes. So there you go. We sort of <laughs> pre-answered that question. Uh, are there any size comparisons or anything like that? I think it's, it's powered by seven of them, if I'm not yeah, mistaken. Correct. But are these, uh, how big are they, I guess, is the question here. The size of a person, size of a car. Yep. No, so it's a one, one mega newton thrust engine um, with a one and a half thousand psi chamber pressure. So you end up with like a four hundred millimeter chamber thereabouts at, at those pressures. Okay. All right. Um, let's see here. A, a lot of these we've actually already talked through. Um, Paul Kelly asking, how do we pick the size for neutron? Did you work backwards from the current payloads? And, and that mm -hmm. is what you talked about, sort of that 8,000 kilogram range. Something that we don't often hear, and a lot of people sort of go, they miss this part, is why don't you design for 100 tons? You know, it'd be so much better to send yeah. 100 tons to orbit at once. And they don't think about, well, which orbit? where are you taking exactly. these hundred tons right so was that yeah. also a part yeah 100 percent. i mean um so so i think i think that's that, that's a good point i mean if you if you have a if you have eight tons worth of payload and a vehicle that can lift say 60 tons yeah you don't get a discount for all the mass that you don't right. lift yep um you the buy that cost rocket. the same regardless of how yeah. much payload you put on it yep exactly you buy in that rocket think of it as one 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 time purchase so it doesn't it doesn't make it make any difference and you know when you're trying to build constellations you want different planes different altans um and um and and what that really means is is having to you know to do a number of rocket launches to to fulfill that that plane so that that's really you know where 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 neutron was evolved from and we can lift around around about 90 percent of all of the payloads that, that are predicted in the next decade or so now we can't lift 100 percent of them Right. Um, and you can argue that the, the, that the 10 percent that we can't lift are probably disproportionately highly priced. Mm -hmm. um, however, um, you know, if, if you look at the maximum impact that you can have, um, it doesn't make sense to you know, double the size of the vehicle to lift that extra 10 percent of the right. payload. And, and there's other that, people that do that better than us. Yeah, sure. And that's not to say that there won't be rideshare opportunities, because even on Electron, which is a dedicated small launch vehicle, rideshares have worked out nicely there as well. So would Neutron still have the ability to take advantage of the extra payload space to launch more small payloads, as, of course, not just Constellations, but from different customers as well? Um, is that still going to be something in Rocket Lab's future? Yeah, I mean, look, well, look at the end of the day, we're, we're, we just want to get people on all of it. So right. um, if, if, if that closes nicely, then then that, 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 that works fine. Um, you know, the, I, I think the, the jury is still a little bit out about how, how effective those, those ride share missions are with large launch vehicles. I mean, they're, they're lifting a lot of spacecraft, but you know, the average lift mass is sort of between one and a half and two and a half tons on a, on a big vehicle. So, um, you know, they're getting, they're getting payloads to orbit, but I'm just not sure if it's, it's, um, it's actually, you know, financially break even. Right. Mm. Right. Uh, let's see here. Um, there was another question about the Archimedes here. So let's see if we can hit this one. Can you ask about Archimedes test infrastructure? Can they use the same test facilities as with Rutherford? Are you building new ones from scratch? Is this yes. happening somewhere else? Is it, are there tests that are happening at your current facilities or how is that shaken out? Yeah, no, great question. So there's a bunch of stuff that we can do uh, with, with existing um, uh, electron facilities and you know, single element injector testing and GG testing and a bunch of stuff like that. Um, but I will say that there's a, once again, there's a fairly competitive process that's running um, with respect to Archimedes kind of uh, home. And then uh, with respect to kind of stage level tests, then um, we're, we're anticipating those being at the launch site because uh, if you're, if you're, for example, if you swap out a bunch of engines, then you probably want to do a quick stage test just to validate all the systems. So you, you're, not trans, you're, not, you're not transporting a giant vehicle around the country to, you know, to do those tests. So right. the kind of larger infrastructure tests will be done at the launch site. Yeah, makes sense. I'm going to hit a couple more here. Um, yep. Here was a question, and it sort of takes us back to this graphic that we've seen before. Why does Neutron have four fairings, four fairing parts, mm. I guess? Why not three? Why not two? Why not eight? Yeah, I mean, and I would say that that's, that's still in trade. Fundamentally, the reason why there's four at the moment, um, there's two reasons. One, uh, one is because uh, you, you need to have that uh, payload kind of entry or exit clearance yep. um, as, you're, as, as you're kind of 
you know, dispensing from the interstage. So if you have two halves, then the halves have to travel much, much further to provide that clearance. Um, you know, the, the exit cone, then if you have four pedals, they don't need to open as much. Right. Um, so, so yeah, the, the, but there's a trade there because the four is more complexity and ultimately more mass versus the two. So, so that's something that is, I would say, is still in trade a little bit with the vehicle. Yeah. It's kind of the four pedal, four pedal camp and then the two pedal camp. Gotcha. Well, it worked for James Bond with the four pedals, so I don't see why not uh, stick with that. Um, well, the, the original the original rationale for four pedals was actually for error braking. So um, ah. that's that that's and and you know earlier on we were hoping that uh, we could actually control the, the the cross range and down range using those using those pedals. Wow. And okay. Not to have those four canards, but um, it created the challenge with that is that obviously the loads get crazy um because you know for aero braking especially they get super crazy yeah uh, also like the gnc team have got enough work doing you know to get targeting and and you know cross range and down range right let alone give them like a super suck aero surface to work with yeah. um so that so at least if we give them some some you know aero surfaces that you know when you actuate it what happens right right is, <laughs> is a good place to start versus given this a morpholous shape and say, "Hey guys, look at this. Look at this out, yeah." So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is so in, that, that so the four, the four is kind of a, a hangover from an earlier design iteration. Gotcha. And you've you've used the term pedals a few times here. So, is that the official term we should use? Like, it's a four pedal design. We can call it that. It's like, the, oh, that's what we call it. You all call right. It, yeah. I mean, it, it's more affectionately called the hungry hippo the internally. Hungry, but, hungry um, hippo, nice. It's like a, like a combination between a sandworm and a hippo, I think. So, uh, let's see here. We'll get one more, Thomas, and then we'll keep on going. Um, sure. Here was one. This was I got this graphic up, so I'll keep going with it. In your update mm -hmm. video, you talked about the the second stage being hung from the payload separation yeah. plane, right? Yeah. And so, how talk a little bit more about that? How does that work? Do, how does that change the design? I imagine it means the second stage can be lighter because it doesn't have to carry load, right? Yeah, look, I mean, if you're a structural designer, your job in life is to get the mass of the payload, the reaction load into the tank walls mm -hmm. as efficiently as you can, and then down the tank walls and, and back into the thrust puck at the bottom. That, that That's your kind of job in life. Um, now, if you look at a, a, a normal kind of second stage, um, you know, you have to go through the second stage, down, you know, through the end of stage, down into the, into the tank, and then ultimately back down into the, the first yep. stage thrust puck. So, you know, the, 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 the most efficient thing you can do here is to not go, not have to transfer any loads through that upper stage because, um, and this kind of comes back to a little bit the, you know, the, the, the smashing of the, you know, the material uh, experiment thing is like the dominating load case here is not actually the pressure loads, not actually the pressurized, pressurizing, pressurizing the tank is not the dominant load case. Yeah. That's an awesome load case because when the tanks are pressed, then you've got tons of buckling margin. When the tanks are unpressed pressed and you're sitting on the ground, what the, the load case you're always battling with is buckling. So if you look at a lot of rockets, you'll see a tremendous amount of internal structure in them. Yeah. You know, um, vertical internal structures, um, less, less on the radial, uh, and all of that is to deal with buckling. That is that is your that is the dominating load case that you're always fighting against. It's not, you know, if you want a balloon tank and just pressurize it all the time, yep. then that's yep. easy. But that's not really practical for loading propellants and, and all of those kinds of things. So, right. you know, the buckling load case is the one that, um, you know, that, that you have to deal with the most. So going back to the second stage, the second stage, not putting the second stage in, in the line of compression, in the line of stack, means you eliminate that buckling case. So if you look at, if you look at neutrons, you basically have the, the you know, the fairing, um, the fairing attachment point is the same as the payload cone attachment point. Yeah. And then everything below that is hung. It's like a balloon, if you will, hung below all, below all that. And because you're not transferring any of those buckling loads, basically all of that tank is there to do is it's like a sack, a sack to hold fluid, if you will. Yep. And, you know, the, the beauty of that is that the moment you pressurize that tank, it's all intention to be able to react the thrust loads. So um, you don't have, you just eliminate all the buckling loads out of it. So you, you can, you know, the, the upper stage just becomes ridiculously light. Now that's awesome because an upper stage, the one thing that you need to concentrate an upper stage is the lowest mass and the highest performance possible. Right. 
So if you look at if you look at neutron, the upper stage is actually pretty tiny compared to the first stage. That's because it's just incredibly high performance. So I kind of think of it like you know a centaur, except made out of a material a quarter of the weight. Right. Um, and then you, you you get this awesome awesome high performance stage. Gotcha. Which costs nothing to build. I mean, like you measure the amount of time because the carbon's so thin. You measure the amount of time to put down the carbon by an automatic fiber placement machine in hours. All right. Well, let me, I'm going to draw a couple things here and correct me if I get this incorrect. But what Peter was just saying about about hanging the the second stage, you have sort of the plane of the fairing that's right here, right? And that's where the, the the pedal is actually attached to the rest of the body. And you're not putting that load right here or right here, right? That's actually somewhere around here where that right. sort of connects to the plane of the fairing. And when you look at this payload, the payload is sitting here. And then the upper stage is, is sort of sitting back here with the engine on it like that. Did I get all that? Yeah, yeah pretty much. Yeah. Um, so the actual the, the structural loads are happening right here instead of having to build the tank rigid enough to actually stand up on its own. Think of it this way, like like put water in a Ziploc bag or something, right? And then hold the Ziploc bag like this versus try to hold the Ziploc bag in your hand. And that's sort of what you were talking about. It's, it's a bag to hold propellants that are sort of hanging from it. Um, and that contrasts with some of the other designs where if you have a, I'm going to draw this one vertically, but if you have the main stage of the rocket and then you have a second stage here and then you have a payload on top like this and you know, draw a little fairing around it or whatever, um, you actually have to design this stage here to carry the load of all this stuff on top. And that's what you're getting away with by what you said in the update video hanging the upper stage from the plane of the, the payload separation plane, I think is the terminology you used, right? So Correct. did I sort of draw that correctly? Perfect. I couldn't get away without drawing something on stream. Chat wouldn't let me do it. So, <laughs> <laughs> so right. we were talking about materials here, and I think that's a great segue into that experiment that you showed because you know we were going to talk about this. <laughs> um, yeah. One of the very, very cool thing to show with the steel. Just, just and before the we aluminum. get into this, though, I should say, like, don't take this too seriously. Like, this is... <laughs> Listen to the listen to the music that's playing in the background. This is really fun. <laughs> I'll listen to the. Actually, I think we could do that. Let's see here. I'm just going to bring this up and uh, let's go through a second. If you watch the update video, here's what Weight we got. Is absolutely everything in a launch vehicle. So what we set up here is a little bit of an experiment. We have roughly one square meter of material here, and we've allocated 3.5 kgs per square meter of the rocket. Stainless, now, stainless steel. Stainless steel is quite a popular choice. <laughs> now I'm excited so by like a million people. <laughs> <laughs> we did the same thing with aluminum. Like... That's not very good either. <laughs> okay then, let's try something new. Let's try carbon composite, but not any kind of carbon composite, a rocket lab carbon composite. Donk. You'd seriously buff it off? Yeah. Oh, it's, it's completely <laughs> unmarked. <laughs> oh, so, so this experiment was in the update video, right? And yep. uh, showing some different, I guess, a some very specific test of some different materials there and sort of explaining why you went with, I guess, the 2050s material, you call it, as opposed to the, the 2020s material. Or 1960s. We've been making stuff out of stainless <laughs> steel for literally ever. So... Mm. Thomas, uh, I brought this up because you brought it up. So where are we going yeah, with yeah. materials? So we already talked about how the carbon composite is actually evolved from the electron composite. It's a little bit different. Um, but comparing it to these other two materials that are also very prevalent in many different rockets, stainless steel going back to ridiculously early rockets and also some currently built future rockets, you know. Um, but there's other factors that take you know take into consideration when you do do these serious comparison of these materials outside mm. of the less serious but very cool experimentation yeah. um yeah. you have things like pressurization you have things like if you're putting cryofluids into them the temperature changes can also improve yeah. characteristics so how did all of those things factor in choosing composites for the new neutron rocket yeah look i mean and we we have tremendous amount of experience on the cold side of composites and and the hot side of composites mm -hmm. um 
So, uh, you know, so e everything is a trade. So if we start off with aluminum, or as we call it down in New Zealand, aluminium. <laughs> there um, you go. But uh, we start off with aluminum. I mean, aluminum has a temperature temperature, um, a temper temperature of around about 200 degrees C. So what that basically means is if you exceed 200 degrees C in aluminum, you're toast because you take all the temp temper out of it and right. all the strength out of it. So uh, carbon, carbon composites, you know, um, we, we routinely go to 200 degrees C and maintain pretty much the majority of its mechanical properties. So you're already as good from the high temperature side as aluminum. Now on, on the cryogenic side, it doesn't do anything. It doesn't like stainless steel gets slightly stronger in, in, cry, in, in composite temperatures. It also gets less ductile, so it gets more brittle. Right. So there's always a trade that you make. Um, it's not all for free. Um, carbon composites, you have to deal with a lot of interlaminar shear strengths and micro cracking and bits and pieces like that. But I mean, um, with, with Electron, we've, we've kind of solved all of those problems. Um, so from a, from, it doesn't do anything great when it's cold and it doesn't do anything nasty when it's cold. Um, right. Pretty just ho-hum. Right. Which is, which is what, what you want. A theme. But I mean, <laughs> I mean, yeah, boring. Yeah. Yep. So yep. the thing is that, um, as I mentioned before, buckling is the load case that you have to deal with the most. Um, and although that, that experiment was kind of just a bit of a gag, sure. um, it does, ne nevertheless, I mean, buckling is, is kind of the dominant load case. So, um, you know, a, a structure in, under pressure is, is, is simple. I mean, the carbon composite has uh, the same or slightly higher tensile strength than, than half hard or full hard stainless steel, for example. Right. Certainly much, much higher, you know, much, much higher uh, tensile strength than aluminum. Um, but it's, of course, compared to stainless steel, it's quarter of the mass. So, you know, you, you end up with the same specific strength, but um, at quarter of the mass, which is, you know, really enables us to, 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 to do all of the things that we want to do with this vehicle. But the downside to that, as we talked about earlier, is you can't iterate with carbon composites easily. You can't just like weld a bit on here and weld a bit on there. Right. You know, for, for a program like Starship, that's exactly what you want, right? That, that when there's a high iteration, you know, it would be it would be really, really hard to build that that vehicle out of composite because you'd have to go back and for six months build you and build yourself a new mold right. every time right. you wanted to design it. So right. Having a guy out there with a grinder but, for know, a few minutes, like <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Way you go. Well you go. Off. Um, yeah, yeah, which, which which is which is great, but you end up with a vehicle that's four times heavier, um, and then you end up with having to put a whole lot more effort into propulsion um, to counteract that mass. Yeah, that, that's there's no free lunch in this game, right? This is this is just this is what happens. Yeah. Um, but I mean, as, as I mentioned, we've got a tremendous amount of experience with composites. Um, you know, we, we might take one or two iterations on on the outer mold line, but that that'll be it. Um, you know, when it comes to uh, you know common bulkheads and all of the all of the you know the thermal issues that you have to deal with especially thermal issues between metallic and composite fittings that's right. the worst because you have a carbon composite which has a thermal expansion of like zero and then you have to interface it with a piece of aluminum or stainless steel which has a really really large thermal you know thermal expansion coefficient that all those lessons are learned we know how to do all that but yep. if you had to learn those lessons from scratch they're painful lessons to learn yeah and um, i so. i want to reiterate uh, this sort of thing that you said earlier where there's an idea oh carbon composites are too complicated they're this that the other you already have a lot of experience with them because you're already flying them right but like you said you sort of move the complexity around if you if you want to have oh we're just going to use stainless steel well guess what you got to move that stainless steel you got to lift it so you have to put all your complexity into your propulsion in here you've got the complexity that you already have experience with in the carbon composites and so your compulsion i don't i don't say less complex but it probably is less complex it's, yeah, it's, it's, more, it's less complex more boring, so boring propulsion yeah that's the whole point boring right? propulsion yeah, you won't get as many yeah. likes on Twitter or anything like that, but it's ho hum standard just gets you to space, right? Well, I don't know. Landing rockets should get a pretty <laughs> substantial should, amount should. of likes on Twitter, regardless <laughs> of how boring the engine is. You yeah. know, <laughs> yeah. definitely looking forward to that. I want to talk about that a bit because we we haven't talked a whole lot about that flight profile. We were talking about its baseline to return to launch site, which, but as a rocket viewing fan, I am very excited about because viewing mm -hmm. rockets coming back to land has been something very cool. And we don't get a whole lot of it. Really um, quickly, really quickly, yeah. Peter. I've seen this yeah. before. I've seen a lot of stainless steel, and all you have to do is pressurize it. This will pop right back out. <laughs> it's fine. Yeah, good. But that, remember, that's not the dominating load case. Yep, the dominating yep. load case is an unpressurized rocket sitting on the launch pad. Yep. That's where the buckling is 
it's all over. That's the hardest thing to solve. For. We've seen a lot of buckling in stainless steel of things sitting on launch pads. So anyway, sorry, Thomas, I, I couldn't get no, out of here right. without <laughs> letting all <laughs> of we, our viewers know. We also know. talked about earlier how if you tried to incorporate pressurization earlier on in, in the process, that reduces your turn, that improve, increases your turnaround time, yep, makes yep, it worse, yep. and all of those things. Yep. We talked about that earlier. Sorry to jump um, in there, Thomas. I, I, couldn't, <laughs> no, I couldn't let absolutely. that one pass. <laughs> just, just before we do move off that, because I think there's one, there's one other myth I want to bust, sure. and, that is, and that is the cost in building carbon composite structures. Um, you know, you hear a lot of people say, oh, it's so expensive to, to build anything. Rubbish. I mean, uh, so, you know, especially when you use automated automated um, automated tape laying or right. fiber placement um, you know you can you can essentially 3d print a neutron in composite but not like a millimeter at a time or whatever like at half a meter at a time at, at like two meters a minute wow so it's it's just it's just nuts to you know, nuts to kind of kind of watch i mean uh to, to put it this way to um you know automatic um fiber place an electron fairing it's about eight minutes of time so it's just just goes you know, it's not yeah it's 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 and this is this is a kind of a new technique in in kind of space but in aerospace that's how we've been building wings and wing spars and right. boxes and fuselage forever so you know it's 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 actually a really well understood um technology and if your material is yep your, your cost per kilogram of material is high but there's not that many kilograms of material in there so you know yeah. I think I it, Das, are there chat questions about the material stuff too? I realize I didn't ask for any chat questions on that, so we can probably, do that too. If you want. Yeah, let me see if I, I got this real quick because Peter, this is mm. some of the rolling, right? Some from the update right. video. This is how fast it's sort of going. It's not like super slow. This thing is just going around. Did I get the yep. right visual there? Yep, you got it. Yeah. Got is it. that in real time or is that sped up? No, that's real time. No. Kidding. Oh wow. Well, so there you go. <laughs> yeah. Because I knew I had seen this, and look at that thing's just—it's like you said, just going around. It's measured in meters per minute, not millimeters yeah. per minute. That's really yeah. cool. All right, uh, let's see here. Chat questions about materials. Um, I'm gonna scroll for a second and see if we can get anything. Did we did we talk earlier about uh, neutron using the new thermal coating that electrons getting? Is it informed by electron? Is it the same sort of thing? Did we go over that earlier? Not exactly. Yeah, look, if, if, the, if the TPS is effective on electron, then we'll, we'll push it over to neutron as well. Gotcha. Uh, here's one from 402 Gaming asking, is there a concern of the locks reacting with the carbon fiber? And if so, mm. how's the inside of the locks tank protected from it? That's a good question. Yeah, it's a great question. Yeah. That, that's actually something that we had to solve for electron um, uh, many years ago. So electron is a lineless composite pressure vessel. And, um, you know, the, we, we had to do quite a lot of work um, on, on resin systems and, and things like that. Uh, and we actually ended up doing all of the BAM full hammer testing, which tests, uh, tests ignitability in, in that environment. So we, we almost ended up as good as aluminum um, with, um, with respect to that. So, um, so yeah, no, that, that was a huge piece of work that we had to solve um, for, for Electron right at the beginning. Yeah. But again, experience. I mean, you're you're working on this already. You've already been doing this for, at this point, years. Like, you've got that experience. You've already sort of worked out that knowledge, and you're scaling it, right? Mm -hmm. All right. Let's see here. Um, anything else? I don't see any other material-specific questions in the queue here, Thomas. I'll continue. Well, all right. We're going to come yeah, back. We'll have more going. time for questions in a second here. But yep. I want to talk about this flight profile as another mm -hmm. talking point. The benchmark for reusable rockets for a little bit now has been SpaceX Falcon 9, right? And they cool. developed the two different infrastructures. You have the downrange landing and the return to launch site landing. And right. it does both, but the downrange landings have been the vast majority of what mm -hmm. their customers have ended up needed. Granted, that rocket's in a slightly different payload class, more towards heavy lift than medium lift. So it's slightly different from Neutron, so maybe that'll be part of your answer here. But but why is what how is Rocket Lab seeing the choice of tipping the scales towards return to launch site? Is it really driven by that turnaround metric of not wanting to wait yeah. for a platform to come back? You can't turn around a rocket in twenty four hours if, if you gotta wait three days for it to come back on a boat. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. And also I can tell you one hundred percent in full honesty, marine assets suck. Like a hundred percent suck. Oh, They're no. so expensive. Like it costs and, and look, 
um, you know, we, we, we love our contractors that help us um, doing electron recovery. Yep. Let's just say the state has that effect. But it's $65,000 a day just for the boat, one boat. And it's a tiny little tub of a boat. Wow. Um, marvelous machine, but tub of a boat um, that sits at the wharf for $65,000 a day waiting for us to launch. Wow. Um, can you imagine what it costs to, to like have a 200 foot machine out there? And like it's, and I'm, I'm sure if you, if you talk to Elon, he'll tell you the same thing. It's just like, Marine assets are really, really expensive to run yeah. um, and maintain and operate. So, um, you know, ironically, it costs us like an order of magnitude, probably two orders of magnitude less to go and scoop the, the rocket, uh, scoop an electron with a helicopter than it does to even have a boat out there. It's like, right. you know, the helicopter is four and a half thousand dollars an hour. It takes a couple of hours to get there, a couple of hours to get home. It's dirt cheap. Yep. Um, so, you know, so getting rid of marine assets was something that we said, look, we, we just, we have to do that because it's just a whole nother constraint um, with respect to, you know, sea states and, and all of that kind of stuff yeah. and costs ultimately. So the obvious is return to launch site. But um, once again, you can see that like it's a 15 ton expendable vehicle and an, and an eight ton return to launch site. And that's sporty. I mean, we've, we've, it's only because we don't do that extra re-entry burn that we're able to to get that 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 such an increase in performance. Yep. So we tr we trade a lot, like the vehicle grew a lot in size to be able to maintain that eight tons, but to return to launch site. I mean, we've seen marine assets at those other companies kind of get streamlined into vessels taking on multiple roles, vessels yep. being, you know, mm -hmm. wholly owned and operated by the actual launch provider instead of contracting. So we mm -hmm. can see the evidence of that happening, but there's the turnaround times, the cost benefits, and just the overall kind of con ops simplicity that comes with return to launch site uh, is definitely prevalent. And even we've mentioned the Starship program, that's also moving towards everything returns to launch site, no marine yeah. uh, or no marine assets. So we can see that's not an uncommon theme. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's, it's something, it's a, it's a note to make. I mean, we get so excited because it's like, oh, look, there's this barge coming in and it's got this big rocket on it and we've got cameras <laughs> looking. We're all excited about that, right? But that's, three or four days after depending on right. the sea and how was the weather right. and how are the currents and all that stuff and so it's amazing as us to viewers to see this thing coming in but if you're looking for the rapid reusability i mean we see it come in and then all of a sudden there's legs to fold up and all this other stuff and yeah. oh it took them a day to fold the legs up and now we need to lean it over then we're going to transport it over and all this infrastructure is really awesome to see but if you're really trying to optimize for rapid rapid reusability putting it right back on the launch pad is is really the way to go it seems Oh, 100%. I mean, you've just described everything that, that is just like, you know, pulling dollar bills out of your wallet. Yep. I mean, yep. that's you, that's all the stuff you want to avoid. Um, so, yeah, hence the reason that the whole design concept around Neutron is just don't have it. Makes good sense. So on the return to launch site flight profile, you've gone with, you have these canards, of course, the fairing, Fairings as control services sounded really cool, but obviously there's tons yeah. of problems there. So yeah, you've gone with the canards design, yep. which mm -hmm. is... You know, so we've seen other reusable launch concepts use that design. We've also seen those with like grid fins. Is that a trade that you guys looked at? Yeah, I mean, so grid fins are, are an awesome kind of control surface for a minimum package um, and, you know, great, great drag as well. Um, however, you know, we're, we're, th this vehicle is designed from day one to be reusable and we shouldn't lose sight that, you know, kind of the, 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 um, you know, the, the kind of the premier vehicle today that's being reused was never designed from day one to be reused. So it's kind of appended with things to make it work uh, versus, you know, design from day one. And, um, you know, have, having things that you have to deploy kind of sucks. So let's not deploy anything in the first place. Right. Um, th this is why the base is the diameter it is, um, is because deploying landing legs is, is just another mechanism that you have to maintain and operate. And we, we kind of, said you know from day one in fact we've i've still got a picture of the, the the whiteboard where we ended up drawing a traffic cone and and the traffic cone kind of evolved a little bit but basically it's it's fundamentally a traffic cone like um don't 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 have any mechanisms just make the, the base wide and you know that that also i would say that neutron as well um the design of neutron has been informed just as much on you know from descent than it has ascent so a lot of the a lot of the design elements you see there are, are only there for descent, of course. But I would say that the overall you know design and shape of the vehicle is more informed by actually reentry than 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 liftoff. 
Yeah, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna nitpick the graphic designer real quick here. Um, if we zoom in on the very base, it mm-hmm. almost looks like like these sort of slip together or something like this. So is there some mm. sort of tech you're looking at there where, where these maybe don't retract, but they have some sort of crush core or shock absorbers or something like that? Because it's not one continuous line. Yeah, no shock absorber. I mean, you, you have you have to attenuate um, yep. some landing um, some landing shock. Also, those legs are actually um, surprisingly difficult part of the design because, you know, as, as you ascend, um, of course, your, 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 your plume is expanding. Yep. So you end up with interactions between the plume and those legs. And that's actually the, the toughest thermal load that we have to deal with is actually how we interact with the plume interaction on ah, those legs. Because down low where you've got the air pressure, your, your exhaust is coming out sort of like this. Correct. But once you get up there, you're in the lower air pressures, that exhaust is just coming straight out the side of the belly. Right it's going to hit that. Yep. Right into those beakers, yep. yeah. Yeah. So they don't get out of the way or anything. That's just the thermal load that you're designing towards. It's not like these are going to retract up out of the way or anything in the current design. Yeah. I mean, we, we have to we have to allow them to be movable a little bit anyway for the, the landing attenuation. Yeah. So yeah. The, 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 the trade's still out whether or not we'll, we'll suck them right up in there. But um Really trying to avoid any 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 kind of active mechanisms as possible. Right. I mean, as a shock absorber, they're just a you know a gas strut. Yep, um, yep. So if we can if we can remove any any kind of you know actuated elements, um, we'll definitely try to. But that is that that's actually one of the like I mentioned that's that's one of the, the toughest thermal um, parts of the design to deal with. And if we can't deal with it thermally, then we'll have to suck it back up in there. But yep. At the moment, yep. it's it's in the wind. Gotcha. That's... Do those streaks running up the side, are those double as sort of raceway protection for if you're going to have yep. piping or electrical connections down the side? Hmm. Yep, they, they have two functions. One is one for our, for our um, downrange. Um, so it actually, it, those strikes are actually aero surfaces for the right. downrange. Um, and yep, they, they, they form as the, the raceway because don't forget we're umbilicaling everything in at the bottom there. So right. all of the, the upper stage um, uh, propellant and service lines run up those raceways. Yeah, because there is no there is no tower at the top. That's something. Well, that the I... go ahead, Thomas. Will the piping for the upper tank in the first stage also go up the side, or will you have a central through through the bottom tank kind of design? From the suction lines, you mean? The, the, for the first stage, so, so you'll have two propellant tanks in the first stage. Will the upper stage be fed through the first one, or through a raceway up the side? Through the raceway, the raceway up the side. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So think of it. Think of it like stage one is fed from one side of the strike, and then stage two is fed on the other. Gotcha. So th- that was something that I was going to note real quick. I hadn't noticed that before, but the rocket isn't like quadrilateral sym- symmetrical there. Right. It's it's almost like bilateral symmetry where you have the mm-hmm. two side strakes that go all the way up here, but then you don't see the thing on this face, and I, I'd assume the other side is the same way. So does that have anything to do with the way that it reenters? Does it reenter with right. those strakes sort of coming like this into the airflow, or it's not going to go sideways, right? Yeah, so so actually the, the the downrange one of the biggest constraints and the hardest things to to deal with is overperformance on the downrange. Okay. You know, which generally in a in a rocket overperformance is a good thing, but when you're re-entering, it's a bad thing because if you overperform on the glide ratio on the downrange, then you overshoot the launch site and right. end up somewhere else, which is that somewhere else is generally not good. Right. So, um, <laughs> not where you're supposed to land. <laughs> No, no, no. So actually, that, that's one of the one of the bigger challenges here is is um, ensuring that the rocket does not overperform, because if it, if it overperforms and then you go, oh, oh we've overperformed, and you terminate, you're still like it's still a problem. Yeah, it's still yeah. a problem. Yep. yep. So um, so so that is actually one of the one of the biggest challenges with RTLS is is actually uh, making sure that you sit in that underperformance regime and never never end up in that overperformance. Yeah, makes sense. I, I hadn't seen, and maybe it's out there, but in the video, do we see a render of the engine placement? Are we doing six around the outside and one in the middle? Or a ring yeah. of seven? Are they all uh, giving you some thrust authority or like thrust, thrust vectoring where you can gimbal them yep. all? So they all move. Yeah, no, we, we, we always TVC all engines. All the engines. Uh, because if you lose an engine, then, um, then, then, you're, then you're toast. Makes um, sense. You, you lose control authority generally through max q yep. um so um no we always gimbal both axes of our engines um, right. it's a little bit more complexity but it just provides that that extra um, reliability and for a neutron it's really nice because the upper stage engine has almost the same throttling and performance requirements from w- with respect to thrust than the landing engine does so both those both those engines kind of drive once the, the, well, the second stage engine is actually driving the engine requirement um, if it was up to me, I would just have one engine at the bottom if that was possible because 
more engines is just more hassle. Right. Um, so, so, but that's not the way it works. But it's there's kind of a really nice ratio, a golden ratio, where if you size the upper stage engine perfectly, then it's actually the perfect size for a landing engine generally. Cool. And this is this is something that happens quite often. Like we get a render, and then we all love over analyzing the render. Like, oh, is that a thruster? Or is that a light? Like, what are we looking at? But this is a perfect opportunity to ask questions about what we're seeing, like the legs and the raceways and stuff. Um, Thomas, anything else we can nitpick? Well, we got the guy that knows on the uh, on the line here. Well, well, I do. We, we were talking about. We're presuming it'll land under that one central engine, and that'll be its landing engine. Right. Um, and of course, we were talking about how it's going to re-enter. Is it coming in so, sort of sideways? Is it coming in engine section first? That's the other big question. When you see like an aerodynamic face like uh, shape like that. Yeah, engines first, hundred percent. I mean, the, the the name of the game here is to push that shock wave with a big blunt body right. as far forward as you can. That's why Electron's so successful. Is is we we control that corridor just super accurately and just push that shock wave right forward. If Electron gets out of kilter a bit, like a few degrees or a degree here and there, then then that 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 shockwave kind of attaches itself and just mm -hmm. unzips the rocket like like hot knife through butter. Right. Um, and you know you know neutron is a bit more forgiving. Um, if you look at the the, the the shape of it, and you'll notice that you know from the cylindrical tank section, it's it's continually decreasing in diameter in kind of a relatively even way, mm -hmm. mathematically even way. And that that's that's for a reason. So as you're re-entering, especially as you know during during um, the, those hypersonic velocities, is having that ever decreasing diameter means that um, it's always decreasing in pressure. And because it's always decreasing in pressure over the length, then you can't have shock waves attached. A, a spot for them to sort of stick to, I guess, to use probably the wrong terminology. Yeah, it's stagnation, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, here's a really great question I want to toss in real quick. Uh, for the return to launch site, we've seen some other vehicles where they sort of target something else, and then once everything's cool, yeah. then they sort of target the launch site. Are you looking for right. a similar situation here? Yeah, that's, that's, the whole, that's the whole performance issue that you have to deal with, yeah. Gotcha. So you'd be targeting like a offshore or whatever, and then whenever you get your engines lit, then you do that final sort of adjustment that puts you on the pad instead of off in the drink, I guess. Yeah. So there's a, there's a certain point in the trajectory where it doesn't matter what you do, you can't overperform the boundary. Right. Um, so it's once you reach that that point in in the trajectory, then 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 you just kind of start to start to you know to drift to the ultimate land point. But there is a kind of defined point in the trajectory where there's no, nothing you can do that's going to push it, you know, into an overperformance right. regime. Yeah, gotcha. Tom, Tom so, the probability is the probability is lower. Yeah, right. Gotcha. And so I got to ask. Obviously, most reusable launch programs have had some sort of we call them hop tests, ways to start working on propulsive landing. And this will be Rocket Lab's first propulsively landed vehicle. So is Neutron going to incorporate some vertical takeoff, vertical landing test program of some kind? Yeah, we'll see. We'll see where we end up with. I mean, um, the control. We've tried to to simplify the control um, system as much as we can. Hence, the reason for the the, you know, the canards up the front. Mm -hmm. um, but probably the, the we can we can learn a bit from from the hop test. But at least the thinking is at the moment is that we'll just um, target it out in the ocean uh, a, a point and and have a crack and see how see how well we can target it you know to that point yeah. and um, see if we can we can you know put it down softly in, in the ocean. I think that's that's pretty much, you know, where, where we're going to, where the starting point for us is at the moment. Yeah. That... Right, because that doesn't take away from launching operational payloads on early flights because that oh. post-separation experiment doesn't affect the mission success. Yeah. No. I tell, I tell you what, one thing that, that is kind of, is is kind of the inverse of most rocket programs and that, that's kind of one of the challenging things with Neutron is that generally you build one rocket and then you try and scale up from there and you build more and more and more and more. Well, the, it's the inverse with Neutron because we'll need quite a few in the beginning as we get all of the all the reusability and, right. and, and everything kind of dialed in. But then after that, we don't need very many at all. So it's kind of like the inverse way you want to scale a factory. First, the first up, you need it all scaled as much as you can. You'll be producing as many engines as you can and as many first stages as you can. And then, you know, once everything kind of settles out, then, you know, you need to turn factories off rather than ramp them up. Yeah. There's there's another great chat question here about um, the different trajectories or orbits you might service. So are you looking for Neutron to be able to service all sorts of inclinations? Are we going to polar orbits? Are we going to GTO? Like where all is Neutron expected to go? Yeah, we've we actually had a surprising amount of customer inquiries from, from all sorts of um, trajectories. 
the one I guess that was most surprising is is kind of um, you know GTOs and GOs where where, where you know we, we're never expected you know folks to you know to be looking at those those kinds of orbits, but actually it's surprising the number of of inquiries we've had for for those more high end, high energy orbits. Um, and of course, um, you know, we, we love, um, you know, doing interplanetary, more science interplanetary than, than anything. Yeah. So um, we can get a fair old, you know, chunk of mass to Venus, which is pretty cool. Yeah. And then the follow second part of that question was, how do some of the higher inclinations affect the RTLS? Like, do you have to knock some of the payload off if you're going into yep. a polar orbit, um, but you're still coming all the way back to the launch site? Yeah, no. So, yep, no, definitely. I mean, they're, they're always more energy intensive. So, yep, yep. you end up. Um, you, you end up trading for that for sure. Gotcha. I mean, yeah. the thing is with polar orbits is generally they're, they're Earth observation platforms. So um, there's not generally huge numbers of, of constellations right. um, in, in those Earth observations. Like it's 12 or 20 right. or something like that. It's not like 12,000. Right. So, um, yeah. Gotcha. Thomas, I'm asking a ton of chat questions here, but we've got yeah. four minutes left of right, yeah. time. Here, I've so only got go. one sort of last talking point anyway. So we can talk about, and we're talking about the different missions Neutron's going to uh, support. And you've mentioned that from the beginning, Neutron is going to be future proof for crew rating and being able mm. to support human spaceflight, both for cargo launches to support, say, space stations and things like that, or mm. launching humans themselves. There's no spacecraft, as far as I know, that's what Rocket Lab's actually developing for that purpose, but you're future-proofing the rocket so that that process can be completed more easily later right. on if a customer comes along for it. Do I, have, do I understand that right? Yep, 100%. It's like, it's like uh, if, you, if you're designing your tanks, um, then does it make sure that when you qualify them that they can be qualified for human rating? So you don't mm -hmm. have to go back and re-qualify all your tanks um, and make material you know, wall thickness changes and bits and structural margin improvements. And the, the, reason, the reason to kind of baseline human spaceflight is twofold one um i don't like eating hands so <laughs> um, two is that if, if you're building a vehicle that's capable of human spaceflight then it's a super reliable freight vehicle um so uh so that that's a that's a good place to be you already have the kind of triple redundancy margins built in mm -hmm. and if you're using it over and over again you can kind of afford to put those things in and still maintain a really really cost effective vehicle so um, so that, that's kind of the ethos. Yeah, I'm, I'm really curious to see how the, the pedal hungry hippo design yeah. works with a human rated capsule oh, system. Yeah. It is? No, you, you're overthinking it. I mean, okay. so a capsule is appearing. So just remove the hungry hippos and put the capsule on top. Job done. There you go. And that doesn't affect that when Neutron comes back. Obviously, he's coming back engine first. So coming back without the fairings, since they're not control services anymore either, is okay. All right. Yeah. It doesn't make any difference. Slightly different aerodynamic properties with the, with the blunt open end instead of the uh, the pointy end, uh, I guess you could say. But yes, still. No, I mean, it's the, 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 I mean the, the, the fairing has got such a roll off on it anyway that the, yeah. the, the flow separation, the pressure is decreasing so rapidly over it. So whether it's there or it's not, it'll be, it'll, I mean, there will be, you know, it, it'll 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 give the Gen, Gen C guys a thrill, I'm sure. But um, <laughs> it's not it's, it's not um, yeah, it's it's not fundamental though. Yeah. We have seen rockets shaped with just a blunt open end at the top come back and land successfully. We As know it turns that's doable. Out, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Turns out it's okay. We've seen that um, happen. <laughs> I I think we could wrap it up with a couple more chat questions, Doss. Yeah. Um. There was a question about the margins in Archimedes and uh, engine out into abort options. Mm. So mm. you got seven under there. You lose one. How does that affect? As always, it depends on when you lose it, right? That's a hundred percent. It depends when you lose it. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah. nothing really to be said there, other than multiple engines. You're not relying on a single engine um, to do the to to do the lift, I guess, up into orbit. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it's, and there's the, 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 always a a good argument to have because you can argue that well if you've got more engines the probability of one going out is more um so the whole argument is more engines is better uh, I, I always try and drive the team for the least number of engines possible right. because it's just more engines means more cost um so um but yeah the, the argument around is it is it more reliable to have more engines is to me kind of you could switch yeah switch it either way you, you just missed that one very specific circumstance where one engine out gets you exactly a 1.0 thrust to weight ratio <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see if i can't get one or two more questions here um turnaround times for a neutron you keep saying 24 hours is that sort of what you're designing for with all the different parts of the system rtls fairing doesn't go yeah. anywhere payload just in the top i say with a crane or whatever yeah. is 24 your goal yeah. 
Yeah, so it's, it's a design goal. I mean, I'm not as naive to think that um, actually that's a feasible turnaround time. Sure. Uh, because there's, there's always going to be um, checks you want to do and, and there's always, like, there always be weird stuff you want to check out and all the rest of it. But the point being is if, it, if you start with, with that, then you're going to be somewhere, you know, in the ballpark of somewhere around that. Yep. Um, maybe, maybe, maybe not 24 hours, maybe two days or three days or something like that. But if you start with three weeks, then that's just not the place to start. Yeah. So, um, you know, although it's it's more of a design challenge and got r- rather than like an operational cadence objective. Yeah, gotcha. Um, let's see here. The last question, I, I know you've said that one of your favorite things are the interplanetary missions. So is there anything mm-hmm. about Neutron that specifically helps enable interplanetary? Any sort of design constraint? I mean, we've got the second, the, the upper stage in there, but, but is there anything you're doing to help not just leverage the constellations, but also further exploration with the design of the vehicle? Well, I think, um, you know, if Neutron's successful, then, uh, you know, we'll continue to drive the cost of launch down and down. Um, now, the the, the, super high, the really high performance upper stage is, is actually matters. If you look at, like, a lot of um, interplanetary missions, they require very, very high performance upper stages, yep. uh, typically hydrogen, oxygen stages. Um, so uh, so the Neutron upper stage is a very high performance upper stage, which means that we can, we can you know, throw some pretty decent mass, um, you know, to, to planets. I think we can get like one and a half tons to Venus, I think was the number. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you can do, you can do a lot with that. All right. Well, so, Thomas, Thomas, it's 431. We've kept yeah. Peter one minute over what we promised. Uh, any, oh. any door hangers here? I just, we've talked about, I think all the big points I wanted to talk about, just a big thank you, Peter, for coming back onto the show. Glad to have you back and talk more about Neutron. And we're all very excited to see Neutron's development and see some more reusable rockets coming online. Cool. No, thanks very much, Thomas and Des. It was it's super fun. I love, I love um, uh, to, to get to, to talk some more technical details. So it's, yeah, yeah. questions are great. Absolutely. We appreciate those details. It makes it all a whole lot of fun for us, too. It, it really is. Like I alluded to earlier, you know, we love looking at renders and the super space fans <laughs> love to zoom in and say, like, oh, well, what's this? What's this? And it's like, well, the artist thought that the dish looked good. That's why we put it there. <laughs> um, but it's it's fantastic to have you on the show. Always a pleasure here, folks. Today's show with Peter Beck, CEO and uh, rocket slinger, I guess, for uh, <laughs> Rocket Lab out there, talking a lot about Neutron. If you just came in in the middle of the show, you can always rewind back. The show's going to be here for you to watch. Watch again if you want to go and see some of the other questions. But just across the board, the design goals, the technical infrastructure, all the different things that uh, Rocket Lab and Peter here are looking at to make this not a rocket for the 2020s, but a rocket for the 2050s. Peter, thank you so much for spending the time with us today. Thanks. My pleasure. All right. And uh, also, folks, hey, with me today we had Thomas Burkhart, News Director for NASA Space Flight. He's above me. There you go. We'll Brady bunch it up. (laughs) Thomas, thank you so much for joining us today. Always a pleasure. Always a pleasure to be with you, Das, as well. All right. And uh, lastly here, I'm John Galloway for NASA Space Flight. Thank you so much for watching our weekly show. Again, these shows, we're doing them every week on Sundays now at 3 p.m. Eastern time. It's our weekly space news show where we talk about uh, space news, what's going on. But for now, that is going to be the end of our show. Hope to see you next week. I think nope, we're nope. I was going to say not next week because it's holiday. Oh. But we, but we will, this is actually the last show of 2021, so we'll see you first week of 2022 for NASA Space Flight Live. <laughs> in 2022 all right well folks thank you so much for watching again we appreciate all the support all the super chats and everything that came in if this is the sort of stuff you like you know what to do there's buttons to click to follow the channels and stuff like that but we're gonna go ahead and let peter go now and we will see you nerds later thanks so much for watching and yep see ya Yikes. You bet. Okay. We don't need any more of these.